Kamogorov Arnold Networks. Can. Con. Kane? I don't know. I, I change how I say it every like five seconds. These are a new kind of machine learning architecture that is being positioned next to neural networks, and they make promises about being able to potentially resolve the curse of dimensionality. The authors also make a claim about interpretability, but I don't think that's going to be the big selling point of Khan down the road. So last time we talked about the curse of dimensionality, and by looking at the Kamalgar of Arnold representation, we saw how we could take a function of several variables and write it as a kind of superposition of several functions of a single variable. Did I say that right? I, I gotta make sure I put those modifiers in the right spot. Anyway, if you take a look at the structure of this representation, which used to be called Kamalgarov superposition, it starts to become clear that this is related to a neural network. Each of the phi's and psi's play the role of activation functions. In fact, Sprecher showed that in some sense, you can replace all the inner psi's with a single universal psi. It, that really does give the impression of an, a single activation function, like a ReLU or something like that. The representation is naturally a kind of of two-layer neural network, and people have been making this comparison since before the journal Neural Networks came out. So what I want to talk to you about today is the innovation of Khan that gets us from two-layer networks to networks of arbitrary size. So let's talk about this whole layering thing, and I'm going to make my lunch here if you don't mind. I am hungry. So let's talk about this whole layering thing. It's what neural networks are all about, and I do a lot of machine learning research, but it's not really my thing. Uh, so it takes me a second to get everything straight, you know, in my head. So you have your input layer. This is your input vector that, it, you know, with all the state dimensions, you know, say one, x1 through xn, and then you put all of those into your various psi functions, and we add them together, so you know, overlapped, I guess. Uh, then uh, you take those sums and you put them into the next layer, which is composed of the phi functions, you know, these guys. You add those. Now you add those functions together and that gives you your file function or sandwich, you know, whatever. Uh, and no, this really isn't a great metaphor for the Kamala girl of Arnold Network. It's my lunch and I'm hungry. It gave me an excuse to, to make food. Uh, yes, this is a tofurkey sandwich. Uh, yes, it tastes like cardboard, uh, but mustard saves everything. Yes, <laughs> you can call me the gox of the uh, mathematics niche. My god, that's too much mustard. <laughs> it, let's do this again, but up at the board. Or my makeshift board. This is a Komolgorov Arnold network. This is sort of the, the base level, the one that is based on the Komolgorov Arnold representation. And so this is what it looks like here. Uh, <laughs> the tape's a little bit over it, but uh, let's see, I can move that. So that's the representation itself, where we have f of x1 through xn, and these different components here are all sort of distributed throughout these psi i's, there's psi j i's. So we have a different collection of psi's for every phi. So then these guys are all summed, and then they are inputted into phi i. That's the basic structure of all continuous functions. Uh, you just need to figure out what these psi's and these phi's are. But let's see how this is represented in terms of a graph, which is usually how we think of when we talk about neural networks and layers. So we start off here, over at our x. This is x1 through xn. So this x1 through xn, these are our inputs. And so this is, you know, basically your system state. And so here we're saying it's n-dimensional. And what we're doing is we're taking this whole system state and we're feeding it to all of these guys. So each one of these, this psi 1, 1 up to psi n1, they all get one of x1 through xn. So x1 goes into here, xn goes into this last one. And you do this again for different collections of psi each time. And then you collect all of those guys and we're going to add them together. And once we add them together, we put them in and we think of them as a new variable, say y1 through y2n plus 1 in this case, in the strict Komogorov arnold representation. And so then what we do is we take this y1 and we put it into phi1. And we take this y2 and we put it into phi2. And we take this y2n plus 1 and we put it into this 
phi of 2n plus 1. And after we do that, we take these guys and we go ahead and we add them together. And then that is what gives us F. And so that is our Komogorov arnold network uh, based on the Komogorov arnold representation. But notice there's a few things here. We have this 2n plus 1 there. And so if we strictly follow the Komogorov arnold representation, we give it the same number of fees that we have uh, as a representation, then that means we need to have uh, 2n plus 1 collections here. Now, I don't think the Komogorov arnold network is really going to care about having exactly 2n plus 1, you might be able to get away with less. So this becomes another variable here. So we can just choose this to be, say, m instead of 2n plus 1. And so then what you're ultimately going to get here is that at this point, you have a new state variable, y1 up to ym. This is one of our hidden layers. OK, so that gives us an idea of how we can think of these as a two-layer neural network. And we have this sort of hidden state here or hidden layer with the y1 up through y2n plus 1 or ym. And so we can think of this as giving us a new state variable y1 through ym and we can do that same sort of thing again. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. But first I want to tell you a little bit something I found out about vi arnold which I found extremely uh, upsetting and really surprising. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about that real quick and we'll, while I go ahead and we'll honestly write up this next slide. Okay, so while I was digging into the past 60 years or so of the Komogorov arnold representation, something really struck me. Arnold got this all started by answering a math question that was unsolved for over 50 years and at the age of 19. What were you doing at 19? I was playing Halo. A lot of Halo. I nearly failed my differential equations class because of it. Arnold though? He was a genius working together with another genius, Komogorov, at the USSR. That sort of genius almost inevitably leads to someone getting a Fields Medal. I feel that resolving a Hilbert problem alone should get you most of the way there. And he had another 20 years left to do more great stuff. But he didn't get a Fields Medal. How did anyone miss this guy's brilliance? The thing is, they didn't. Arnold was nominated for a Fields Medal, but then his government came in and put a stop to that silliness. What happened is that Arnold was speaking out against the treatment of dissidents in the USSR. He was saying that it might not be a great policy to, you know, throw people that disagree with you into the gulag. And yeah, the USSR wasn't happy about that. So they told Pontryagin, a mathematician on the Fields Medal Selection Committee who was blind since the age of 14, that he must prevent the Fields Medal from being awarded to Arnold, or they were going to pull out of all sorts of international mathematical events and collaborations. So Pontryagin invited Arnold to lunch, told him about the situation, and asked Arnold to explain all of his work so Pontryagin can make a credible argument against Arnold getting the Fields Medal. Arnold said it was a pretty good lunch. Uh, apparently, and uh, I have a link to more of the story in the description. But ultimately, in 1974, only two of the Fields Medals were actually awarded of the possible three they could have given out. So presumably, that third one would have gone to Arnold. Okay, okay. so this is how you can set up a multi-layer uh, con network. And so what we're going to do is we start the same way we did before. So we have this x1 through xn. This is our input state that we're putting in. So there's x1, x2, x, all the way up to xn. Now, from here, we're going to be mapping over to uh, each of these size. These stay the same. So uh, the only thing I changed here is I put an m1 down here. Uh, this is an m1, which basically differs from the Komogorov arnold representation, which had 2n plus 1. So this will be user selected. Each one of these guys goes individually to each one of these uh, guys here. So you have your y1 through ym1. Now, each of these y1 through ym1s, these become our sort of our new state that we're working with. This is a, a, a hidden state or a hidden layer that we're going to be uh, transmitting to all of these fees. We all right, so instead of just having 2n plus 1 fees, we actually have m2 collections of fees. So uh, this should be a 1 here and a 2 here, but not like you can really see it that well. But basically here, this is, goes from phi 1, 1 down to phi m11 1, 1 to catch all of these y's. So each of these y's, y1 goes in here, y m1 goes into here. And then down in here, uh, y1 goes into here and y m1 goes into here. And all together is m2 of these. So what we're going to do is we're going to add up each one of these guys individually and each of these guys individually. And then we transmit them one at a time to each one of these 
uh, Zs, uh, respectively. So this collection, it summed together, is Z1. This collection added together is Zm2. And so now we have another hidden layer, which is uh, of size M2. So this was size N, this was size M1, and this is size M2. And M1 and M2 are user selected. Now, this last one, we're gonna take each one of Z1s and we're gonna put it into, say, some other function, I'm calling it theta. So we're gonna have theta1 down to theta M2. Now, from this theta M2 and theta M1, we add all of these guys together, and once we add them together, we get F. And so that is quite the monster uh, to write down uh, as a function altogether. But this sort of spreads everything out into layers, so you don't have to write summation after summation after summation after summation. And if you want, you can sit down and try to rewrite this in terms of just regular function notation with sums, but it's, uh, it's going to get pretty tedious pretty fast. Okay, so that's how you build up layers in this framework, but here's a rub. We need to learn each one of these activation functions. This is kind of where the interpretability claims come in, where sometimes they learn the right function, and you see this in the Kolmogorov arnold paper, like sine or cosine, things like that. So how do we learn those functions? Well, that's where the parameters that we'll have to tune come in. We will replace each one of these functions with B splines, which provides a parameterization in terms of the B spline basis. You could theoretically put any function approximation scheme in here. It doesn't have to be B splines, honestly, uh, but we can get into that later. So the next couple of videos here are going to be towards learning how to train those parameters, which is a standard neural network thing of backpropagation, and we can also review B splines and a bit about that approximation theory. You might notice that I'm not home nor am I at my office. I'm in this hotel room. Well, I was invited to give a series of talks or a quote workshop on my perspective on Koopmanism. And this topic really builds on a lot of the machine learning framework I have been putting together on this channel. And well, I need to practice. So you'll likely be seeing some videos on that topic here soon as well. As always, thank you so much for watching. And well, I hope you have a great day.